Well, good afternoon. It is, what are we at here? Sunday, March 26th, 2023, about 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm Delaware State Representative Paul Bombach, serving the 23rd House District, which is the west and north side of Newark, up towards Pike Creek. And it is another time for an update on the Delaware Retirement Health Benefits Advisory Subcommittee and the work that state government is doing on determining what will come for Delaware's retirees, what uh, health benefits will be provided. Uh, this, as many of you already know, uh, is uh, a result of a bill called Senate Bill 29 that was passed in January, and it was uh, passed due to the path that the state took in 2021, 2022, to propose a fairly big change to the uh, retirement benefits for state employees initially planned as of January 1st of this year. Uh, there was a lawsuit involved. It was unveiled to uh, retirees, uh, depending on how you measure it, in early June. Uh, it really became noted for its full impact by August and uproar occurred. Uh, a lawsuit was filed, a judge issued a stay to prevent the change uh, and the state was therefore required to maintain the supplement program called MedicFill, which, it, which is in place uh, this year. And actually one of the developments was that at Wednesday's meeting of the RHBAS, uh, the state announced, uh, actually Secretary uh, Dematius uh, announced that at next month's State Employee Benefit Committee, SEBC meeting, uh, they expect to uh, consider a motion to uh, extend the medic fill not only through the end of this year, but through June 30th of next year. So that's a, a pretty big development that happened on Wednesday. Uh, so I want to uh, mention that. So uh, that is, uh, that's a, a quick update. Um, I think most of the people who tune in here are already aware of, of sort of what's uh, been going on. Um, so uh, with that, I want to first review what happened Wednesday. And uh, actually, is there anything here that's going to, that's not 16th, and no, that's the later one. Okay. So what I'd like to do here is um, bring up, I think that's the format we want. There we go. So um, we had a presentation uh, made by Mary Graham, uh, who's uh, a, a spouse of a, of a retired UD professor and therefore a, a, an eligible uh, person under the state's plan, uh, along with three other people who worked very hard on this, including uh, retired state Senator Karen Peterson, uh, on uh, their view, sort of a, a counterpoint to the state's uh, presentation of what the problems are and what the solutions are. One of the things that the committee and, and I personally have been trying to do is to really uh, uh, ensure the focus is more on what we're doing in the future and doing less looking backward, including because there's a court case involved. So uh, I really, as I say, I want to be uh, driving by looking out the windshield, not the rearview mirror. So, um, and, and I appreciate Mary and her group really uh, doing a lot of focus on uh, that as far as where we are today and what we, uh, what are some ways to look at how we should be doing things tomorrow. So I'm going to uh, just go through here really quickly. It did a whole lot of number crunching. Um, I liked uh, one of the things they did is that they broke the, uh, the, those covered by health benefits in the state of Delaware, uh, employees into three groups, active employees, retirees who are less than, are not covered by Medicare, so less than 65 years of age generally, and then Medicare retirees. Um, so, and then look at how the funding of those three different groups um, is done. Um, so uh, I'll just say that's sort of a big piece. One thing they really noticed is that the presentations by the state often focus on where the dollars go in and where the dollars go out, but it's really looking at the state dollars. And what they point out is that um, unique to the Medicare retirees is dollars go in, you know, to the state and the state pays dollars out, but a lot of those medical costs are covered without the state touching it by the federal government, specifically by Medicare, 80%. Of retirees' medical costs are covered by traditional Medicare. So that's not included, and it makes for a little bit of a warped view 
of things. So I really I thought that was very helpful how they, they pointed that out. We've got a lot of words here. We're going to get to some charts in a bit. Um, I want to mention that um, the uh, we haven't had a verification of the accuracy of this stuff. For that matter, we didn't really have a verification of the accuracy of presentations made by the state. Uh, so, um, but I, I don't want to present this as facts. I want to present this as this is what was presented to the advisory subcommittee on Wednesday by Mary Graham and her, and, uh, her colleagues. And you know, one of the things that is pointed out is that uh, for an active retiree, their costs is you know completely covered by. Uh, the state and the employee, and the federal government has no role. Um, same with somebody who's not covered by Medicare, but is retired, uh, retired state employee. It's all by the state and the retiree. But with Medicare retirees, again, the uh, state is responsible for about 20% and the federal government four times that, about 80%. Um, so very, it's apples and oranges, and that's Im important uh, to, to consider. So, uh, and this is, I, I also like this presentation or this what framing of it, a prison to look through. The uh, costs, the, the challenge here is that when <clears throat> actuaries are required to look at what we have presented as being the state's obligations to retirees, both current and future retirees, and put, calculate what are the dollars of those promises, and then look at what we've set aside um, and say, well, that's how much we funded it. And the gap is uh, a big gap. It's a really big gap. It has a whole lot of zeros. It's in the billions of dollars. Um, and what uh, this group presented is, there's really, and I view it as when you're digging a hole, the first thing to do is to stop digging. So the first thing to do is to have a program that is not losing money each year. So make sure that annually it's covering its own costs. And so that's one piece. And that may be viewed as the simpler piece because the second piece is how do you solve, solve a multi-billion dollar problem? Um, and the answer is you take smallest steps, but you are promising and you do deliver on doing this for decades. So the, so first thing to do is let's look at the annual um, flows and see where we have shortfalls. Let's address that. And then the second is when we know we're no longer digging, now let's find a way to fill the hole. Um, so you know, look at the annual budget and then look at how we're going to address the long-term liability. Um, so uh, okay, go there. So let's look at some charts here. So um, it, they looked at when you look at both the medical and the prescription and operating operating costs uh, for healthcare. Uh, Seventy percent, over seventy percent, is active employees. Thirteen to fifteen percent is non under sixty-five retirees, and then retirees sixty-five and older. Obviously, uh, other you know, fifteen percent. So, um, you know, the vast majority of these costs um, are uh, are from our active employees versus the thirty thousand or so people who are uh, retirees. Um, you can look at that. You know, dollars between medical costs, prescription costs. You can say somewhere around what three and a half times as much of the uh, of the prescription costs are the medical costs, um, and uh, uh, the cost per employee is much lower for Medicare retirees, again, because 80% of, the, of their medical cost, their health costs are covered by Medicare. So um, the Mary's presentation really did a big focus on that. And the cost per employee is less than $5,000 uh, here, but that is more than 15, more than $16,000 per employee or per retiree who's under 65. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, again, a big difference between that. It does beg the question if the state's spending so much less for Medicare retirees, um, why would uh, so much emphasis be placed on changes to the Medicare retirees benefits? And that's a valid question, and we don't have an answer for that yet. Um, so uh, this looks at, let me see, uh, so this is uh, how the costs have increased. It's somewhere around maybe a 3 or 4% annual increase, and it's really all groups have increases in that rough ballpark. So the blue is the active employees, you know, a whole bunch more of the costs, 70% of the costs are through there. And then the two subgroups of retirees, the sub, the less than 65 and 65 and older, you can see those costs are going up. Um, and this really is only looking at the state costs, not the full cost, because the full costs, a whole bunch is paid by the feds. Uh, and so those percents 
only makes sense when looking at narrow prism of just the state costs as opposed to the full medical costs. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, gonna go in there. Um, this one really spoke to me, this slide here really spoke to me, slide 14. And the orange uh, indicates, uh, well, actually the gap between the red and the blue orange is whether that program for that, one of those three groups of, of people, active employees, retirees under 65, retirees covered by Medicare. And what this claims, what this presents, is that in fiscal 22, which was July of 21 through June 30th of 22, active employees had about a $50 million shortfall that spent more $50, $50 million more than it took in, about 30 million more spent than took in, taken in for the sub 65 retirees. And then actually they took in more than they spent for Medicare retirees. I'll leave it there. I think this is an important uh, slide. Um, none of, again, this is as presented by, uh, by Mary Graham and, and uh, her colleagues. So when you take that together, there's three groups. Yes, we have a, over $50 million shortfall for fiscal 2022, but one of those groups wasn't responsible for that shortfall. And that's the 65 and older retirees. Um, so, uh, again, a compelling, uh, presentation of, uh, of data there. Um, and my gosh, I'm, so this is the, how much, um, Medicare health funds. This is the, the main thing is, uh, Medicare retirees, 65 and older retirees, um, are actually overpaying versus what the plan paid in that fiscal year, uh, by about, uh, you know, $60, $70 per person per, I believe that's annual as opposed to uh, monthly. Um, so, but it really doesn't matter that much. Um, not gonna go into anything here. Um, so this is open. So OPED, that's the, uh, other person. Now, this is the non-salary uh, and non-pension, um, employee costs, employee benefit costs, um, and, uh, how much employees are paying towards it and how, and how it's, you can see it's gone down and we are having a problem with funding. So that's one of the things we need to look at. So um, what this is that 1% carve out enhanced funding, that's a phrase uh, I view it as it's 1% of the budget. So starting last June for the current fiscal year, from last July 1st to this June 30th, the legislature passed the budget and the governor signed it. That includes roughly $50 million which is if you multiply that by 100 you get to about 5 billion which is what the budget was so what we did is we took one percent of the budget and we put it just towards this shortfall that's a big thing and then as the budget grows it's more dollars so for the current for the budget that we're working on now that would start as of july 1st of this year it would grow to 51 million so that's an annual amount we put in and again the way to fill the hole is to just keep shoveling dirt into the hole and that's what this 1% is. And as you can see, compared to if we um, add to payroll or maintain the payroll amount that goes in from payroll, we're getting about 9 million, a little bit over 9 million a year. Uh, that's, you know, one, one fifth as much as what the General Assembly is putting in from the, the annual budget. So it's important, but this 1% is a pretty much a game changer. It's, it's a, it makes a very big impact. Um, and it is needed to be done for decades, but it will get us um, uh, closer to filling that hole. Not it, it alone is not going to do it, but it's a big piece. Um, so uh, I'm not going to, frankly, they, they did a lot of looking, I'm going to say backward at what the Retirement Benefit Study Committee, the predecessor to the RH, uh, Retirement Health, RHBAS uh, does. Um, but since I'm focusing on today and tomorrow, I'm not going to uh, the labor, uh, the points there. Um, this is one, uh, from 21. Um, the, what I want to point out is, and, and these are from presentations to the RBSC, the Retirement Benefit Study Committee. I, I show it for the following reason. Um, what will likely be presented and considered by the advisory subcommittee is going to be tables like this that say, 
Uh, you know, you go to a restaurant has a whole lot of choices. Oh, I want something. I want to, I want to have this appetizer. I want to have this entree. I want to have this dessert. I want to have this drink. Um, and so you put together a meal. We plan to put together a way to fill the hole and we'll do a bit here. We'll do a bit here, a bit here. Some of these, the entree is the biggest piece. That 1% carve out that 1% of the budget, that's probably going to be the biggest piece in here. We want that loan isn't going to fill the holes. So we need to get a few more shovels uh, in here. So other layers of things uh, which can help fill the hole. A shift to Medicare Advantage is what the SCBC chose uh, in early 22, 2022. Um, but uh, there are other ways to fill that. Um, and we'll see. And whether you grandfather things, there's a whole bunch of things. We're not at the point with the subcommittee to figure out exactly which um, what what our sort of short list of options are. Um, but uh, there were a lot of classes of options that were considered by the RBSC, and we'll be looking presumably at similar ones uh, over the next uh, few meetings, which are weekly. Um, we have about five weeks until our initial reports due. That said, with the six month extension of Medic Fill, that commitment that's likely to be voted on next month by the RBSC, um, the, the advisory subcommittee may have a little more time. Uh, the urgency may not be as great, sort of and sort of not. So I, I, I may get to that with, with if questions come up. Um, so uh, again, different options. And this is, again, that menu, what do you want for your appetizer? What do you want you know, for your salad? What do you want uh, entree? What do you want for your dessert? Um, so um, do, 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 do. Uh, it, there is the question of what Medicare, the Medicare Advantage adoption uh, in and of itself, how big an impact that is. And uh, it certainly isn't as big as the 1% budget carve out. Um, so, um, so this is suggestions from Mary Graham's group. Um, and I'm sorry, suggestions uh, for them. So options uh, found three L's. This looks like past here. Okay, so um, uh, okay, so what? Um, uh, so there are a lot of uh, what, what they're saying is suggestion to go forward, and and uh, my personal view is the budget carve out, the annual carve out, I think is extremely important. Um, I think that there are some of the adjustments that are on some of those lines, so those you know, some of these lines here that just makes sense. They are, I think, equitable um, and have some impact. And when you collect them together, they have an impact that's worthwhile. Um, and uh, we will see what uh, we need to do. But I, um, the question of whether we have a Medicare Advantage only uh, option for future retirees, uh, retirees in the future, I should say, or whether we have options that include Medicare Advantage, which uh, many states have, um, or whether we have only Medicare supplements, um, a supplement or a choice of supplements um, plans, uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, but that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, I'm going to get to the questions in a sec. I want to go to, what is the other thing I want to go to? Da, 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 da. That one, not that one. That one. The agenda. Okay. So uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. down in Dover, but also you can live, it's live stream, zoomed, uh, live stream. Uh, we have our next meeting and uh, get a little bit bigger. So do keep in mind these connections. Uh, the addresses change all the time. So go to, I got this off of, I just Google searched S, uh, SCBC uh, subcommittee materials. And I got the agenda. You can go to, you can Google search Delaware public meetings and look for tomorrow morning, uh, the RHBAS meeting. Uh, it'll pull up the agenda. And so make sure you use that address, not the one that was used last week. So again, use the one for this meeting, which is on Monday, March 27th at 10 a.m. Um, or come in person and it's at uh, 97 Commerce Way, Suite 201 in Dover. So we're going to call to order, introduce everyone. We're going to uh, look at the minutes and vote to approve them. We're going to look at Medicfill and Medicare Advantage plans. So review what they are, what they aren't. Uh, we're going to look some more the group health insurance plan. That's the when you take all three populations and the, all the money coming in, all the money going out, and how it's projected to go in the future. That's that GHIP 
that is how I call it, uh, GHI, GHIP, um, for uh, next fiscal year, starting July 1st of this year through June 30th of 2024. Um, look at different types of Medicare plans. They're all, they've got letters on them. So how are they different, how they compare to each other, uh, open it up for discussion amongst the subcommittee members and then open it up for public comment. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, there will be information on how to post it online. Uh, let me see if what we, uh, what you may remember is if you are um, in person, uh, you can sign up to, to speak. If you're not going to be in person, you want to speak, uh, you should sign up if you can ahead of time. That will put you higher in the list, so you'll be asked uh, to speak first. Uh, we generally limit people to speak for three minutes um, and then cut you off, but you're always welcome to submit your uh, your comment in full electronically, and then that is both posted publicly and also shared with subcommittee members. Um, so even if you've got four minutes worth of comments, you can give the best three minutes of it and then submit the full set of comments uh, so that we can uh, have the benefit of that last minute of comments in there also. Um, so that is uh, what I wanted to uh, present at a minimum. And I have, I see one question here. They even mentioned the million dollar question. If the seniors aren't the biggest problem causing the deficit, then why target us? Because we carry Medicare and Advantage plans go after our Medicare so they can get 9,000 for each person. <laughs> and give terrible coverage that's happening all over the country and part of why they're uh, getting sued. Um, and this is uh, a, a very good question. Uh, the first thing I'll say is the caveat that I gave at the start, uh, which is uh, this is uh, material that is presented uh, by four individuals. Uh, and uh, we do want, uh, we stated this on Wednesday, we want to make sure that we give uh, our uh, cabinet secretaries, uh, you know, with the departments of Office of Management and Budget, Office of uh, uh, Finance, and Office of Human Resources, opportunity to look over the numbers and see um, if indeed uh, they agree or disagree. Uh, from what I've seen of some preliminary stuff that we may see tomorrow, uh, it looks like uh, it's in that. Uh, it, it's. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of quibbling over that. That that slide 14, I think, was the one. Let's see if I can get that. Uh, up. Uh, it's not going to be there. 22. Yeah. So slide 14 and 15 uh, was the one that really jumped out at me that said, and you can look at it here, is that uh, the Medicare retirees are currently more than paying their way for fiscal 2022. Uh, now, part of this may be that um, uh, and this is something you know the actuaries are looking at. Well, what what about as if our retiree pool currently has an average age of seventy two, but in eight years our average age is going to be seventy eight, and they project the average cost at that point is high. This what happens in twenty twenty two may or may not be representative of what happens over the next thirty years for Medicare age retirees. I don't know. Um, it, we may have had an outlier year in twenty twenty two. I don't know. Um, so I think there's. Uh, we want to look at this and I th personally, I'm going to speak for myself and I, the phrase I like to say is I speak with my subcommittee members. I don't speak for them. So speaking for myself, this jumped out at me. I want to be exploring this and your question is my question, which is um, we have a financial problem, uh, not digging more. I want to look at where the gaps are and what we're doing now that the SCDC has already chosen somewhere around a 9% increase in premiums for active employees. So that is designed to shrink this deficit, which was present in 2022. I think we're going to get an update on 2023 and projection 2024. Uh, and the impact of that proposed increase uh, in, the pen, in the premiums for active employees will be reflected, hopefully, in that analysis. So we're going to be looking at that, each, sub, each population. And then as it relates to the uh, you know, eight to nine billion dollar long-term shortfall, um, it, it is very important for us to look and say, where is that shortfall coming from? Is it from today's employees once they turn retired that our cash flow relationship between money we take in and money we, we spend for that population is out of balance? So then how do we best bring that in balance? Um, one thing that was very interesting um, I found, let me see if it's going to show here. I think it was an earlier slide that showed the cost per, there we go. So this slide here, um, so the Medicare retirees 
in this presentation, on this slide in this presentation, uh, the state pays uh, somewhere around, the state, me, the state and the employee pay somewhere around less than $5,000 per person. So there are states that use this health reimbursement account, HRA, and they fund it with $5,000 a year. Um, and states don't mind doing that. It's only one little problem. Typically, that amount, I think this is how DuPont Corporation did it when it shifted uh, to a, an HRA, is they said, we're going to give you, they said it was $1,200 a year, I think. And that never went up. But those costs go up. So, yeah, we can, we can give $5,000 a year uh, per employee uh, for who are Medicare age towards getting their own supplement um, service, supplement policy. And that will work fine in 2025 and 2026. Uh, 2056, probably not. Uh, so uh, it, it's a real challenge. Um, uh, my gosh, I love your question. Um, so Annette, uh, what would you suggest that we retirees do to help advance your subcommittee mission in a timely manner? Oh my gosh, what a wonderful question. Um, so, um, I've said, and I'll continue to say that, um, I, I want our focus and our subcommittee's time to be focused on looking at what's going on today and what's, what we have choices for doing tomorrow. Um, I personally don't see a benefit of looking back and saying, oh, you know, this cabinet secretary said this in December of 2021 and did what I don't care. I, I don't. What I do care about is what are we looking at now? What are decisions that we can make now? What are choices we can make now? What are structures that we can offer? And what's the impact of that? Um, so um, I, I sort of would look, I'm sorry, the world does not, does not revolve around me, but Annette, your question does. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it that way. Um, I don't need more material that says that Medicare Advantage uh, is very unpopular with a, a good number of people. Um, I've seen it. Uh, you know, have I seen you know, doctors you know, talk about how, how much they don't like it? Have I seen, you know, there was a submitted material uh, of the Mayo Clinic in Florida saying they would not accept, they would not take an appointment from anyone who has Medicare Advantage. They would just uh, refer them to a, a different facility. Um, that's, and, and I've said, active employees and what you offer for them is a different animal than what you offer retirees because retirees are not necessarily based in Delaware. So if we offer something that has a network and that network is a Delaware plus network, that's not going to help someone who moves to their grandkids in Seattle or moves, you know, to, you know, Sun City, Arizona or wherever Sun City is. Um, so we, I think we really need to be uh, focusing on um, uh, what, uh, what choices we're considering, and we are, we are considering Medicare Advantage. That's in our mission for SB 29 is look at the choices, including Medicare Advantage. I want to see, um, I like this presentation to say, where is m most of that $8 billion shortfall, that hole coming from? Is that from projected under, um, uh, under providing for, under charging active employees year by year for their then current stuff? Is it um, this this gap for these pre-65 pre year old retirees and that shortfall and its continuation over years? Or is this Medicare retiree group, which currently appears to be cash flow neutral, if not positive, is that expected to turn south and stay as a deficit for a good number of years. Um, I want to see that. I'm sorry, now I have divergence as far as what you're asking. Um, here, here's, an, here's an idea I've come up with, which is I'd like us to focus on our first priorities. Um, and I think our first priorities, what are our first priorities? One thing is we need to address an eight to $9 billion hole. And it's not something that we need drastic action done today, but we need to have an approach that um, is uh, responsibly uh, can address that. And the second one, and second isn't way down the list, it's the second highest priority is 
we want to do right by our employees and our retirees. Um, and uh, third one is we want to consider all reasonable alternatives. Um, I think that uh, we absolutely need to be looking at a uh, multi-element solution, multiple lot, choose this, choose this, choose this. Um, and then the fifth one may be, want to make sure that we get it done in a time um, that we can implement this uh, sooner rather than later. And I don't mean sooner than June 30th of next year, but um, I think we want to make, I think we, well, one thing I've heard from the administration and I agree with is if the 1% budget carve out is so important, and I believe it is, to a substantial filling of that hole, um, then we need to not just do it every year by choice. We need to institute it in the law and we need to make sure that it's not something that's in an epilogue language or even is added to the governor's recommended budget. It needs to be the default. And it would be good if it makes it really hard for us, the legislature, to disregard that. That should be sacrosanct. Um, it should be 1% or maybe more that we commit to every year until we get that funded level up to 80, 85%. Um, and until then, you need a super, super majority vote uh, to stop it. Um, but again, principles. Number one, we have to be committed to address the multi-billion dollar hole. Number two, we need to be fair to our active employees and our retirees. Um, and then the rest are important, but they're slightly below there. Notice I didn't say we need to not offer Medicare Advantage or we have to, or we need to not offer supplementary. I, need, we, I don't leave with solution. I don't leave with solutions. I leave with the principles of what we're applying in making these recommendations of what the solution should be. Um, so that's how I view it personally. I don't know about my colleagues on the committee. Uh, you know that if you include Medicare Advantage, they will only stay in the game if they have 26,000 people. So I know that was said before, and and I had a conversation about that. I think that's not I think that's not the case. And I know I know that that was said in some form at Golden Eagle. Um, but I believe um, from a conversation, subsequent conversation I had, that that was in the context of um, if our only choice. Um, is to uh, is to have either Medicare Advantage or Medic Fill without any share of the premium being paid by the retiree, then the only way that it would be beneficial towards reducing the gap is if we had Medicare Advantage that was required for vast majority of people. Um, I asked at I think the first subcommittee member uh, subcommittee meeting. I asked the WTW people, I said, we've got 30,000. Is that too small to have multiple pools? I asked that explicitly. And that was this year. Uh, that was in March. And they explicitly said, yeah, you can have groups for less than, you can be in two groups, maybe even three groups. So I know that I, I hear that was said. And frankly, I think I remember hearing that because I tuned into that virtually. Um, but um, that is not something that you should take to the bank and you should not consider that. I don't believe that you should consider that uh, inviolate as far as not being able to have a group of less than 26,000 people. Um, so um, uh, we've, and I think that we heard explicitly by the consultants that we're using here um, that indeed we can have multiple groups, which means we do not need 26,000 people in order to have Medicare Advantage. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, anyway, um, thank you. Any more questions? Um, uh, tomorrow's meeting should be good. Uh, we have a schedule of the upcoming meetings. Uh, let me see if I have, that's not the one, what that is it? Uh, there we go. Um, so I'm going to go to my screen again, that one there. Um, so we've got, it is going to be, I think Monday the 17th. Um, and so we, we've got meeting tomorrow, meeting on the third, I believe that's, that's still correct. Um, and then uh, at least two meetings set in April. Um, we will see, I, I was interested in this 
what is meant by the work groups here. Uh, and I asked about that uh, this week. And it seems like that's building in an assumption that uh, there'll be ongoing work after May 1st uh, and maybe digging into if we were to grandfather, how is it done? If we were to uh, have some premium share, how would it be done? Would it be done uniformly for everyone or maybe a lower share for longer term retirees like those who have been retired for 25 years or more and and a, a higher share for those who are just retiring. I don't know, um, but the work groups is intended to indicate that we're open to uh, the subcommittee having breakouts after May 1st to work on uh, targeted issues and then bring it back to the full subcommittee yeah, would be my expectation. Um, hope that's useful. Uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in. I want to thank you all for, I mean, Listen, this is your this is your future, Frank. This is my future too. Although I'm only if I stay for a few more years. Um, but uh uh you know, I I very much want the state to address this big financial shortfall, and I want to make sure that we are treating our current employees and our retirees uh fairly. So um that's what I bring forward and bring to the subcommittee, and I hope you uh either catch live or uh or uh, later on recorded a uh, meeting uh, from tomorrow morning at 10. Um, I think there's a YouTube page that we'll be using uh, to keep recordings on uh, the state. The, the folks who are helping with this, mainly the division of uh, the Department of Human Resources, is working with the Division of Technology and Instructions, DTI, to get everything done right. Anyway, um, we're trying to have all the submissions made available, all the presentations made available, even recordings made available. Um, and we really appreciate uh, everyone's patience as we work through this. Um, and, uh, and George, good to hear from you. Um, so thank you all. I hope to, uh, you should see, you know, hear from me uh, tomorrow at, at 10 if you tune in. And uh, I, I do expect to be doing this next Sunday. Uh, I think the Sunday after that's Easter. So I imagine I will skip that. Um, and uh, just keep it going. So please uh, don't hesitate to email me if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you and have a good rest of your day.